Let's hit it, eh? Done. This is an interview that I've been wanting to do for a while. It's with Jerry Ryan, a face and name that many in Australian sport would be familiar with. And we've known each other for many years, but we've never sat in front of each other talking in a quiet room. So, given that you are essentially the biggest benefactor Australian cycling has ever known, I thought I'd find out if you still love the sport as much as you did when you started, or this uh, massive green edge uh, proposition. I certainly do. It's a great sport and uh, I'm still very proud of uh, the team that we created. I wonder if we could just sort of step all the way back to when you first sort of learned about cycling and can you explain to me what it is that lured you in in the first place? I grew up in Bendigo um, which was a big track that had the Bella drove there. The Sun Tour used to come through and uh, a friend of mine, a couple of brothers were interested in cycling so him and I used to uh, cycle around, had lots of ambition but very little ability. I always used to follow the Tour de France as we did or the Sun Tour um, and some track but it was 92 that I got approached by Cathy Watt um, requiring some funds to go into uh, some altitude training um, in the Rockies so I wrote a check out and uh, she went off and came back for gold medal. I thought, gee, this is this is a great return on my investment. And yeah, you know, I knew a couple of people, so uh, we decided to set up the Jayco uh, uh, cycling team with uh, Gary Boylan. Um, we rode here in, in Australia and um, in America June, July each year, and and uh, from there, after two years, we we're dominating. I thought, well, okay, what we have to do is. Uh, create events, uh, put money in developing uh, uh, cyclists uh, um, and uh, started investing as a sponsor with the VIS um, and also had a few years with the AIS. You know, we've been involved with the Jaco Herald Sun Tour now uh, for, gee, 11, 12 years as major sponsor. So, and uh, then uh, came across uh, Shane Bannon got involved with the AIS uh, around 12 years ago, um, um, sponsored uh, the, the, the program um, heading into the Olympics for eight years, and then we decided to uh, set up the Green Edge team. Uh, the rest is history. I was in Corsica, and which was basically the prelude to a, a, a halcyon moment in your Green Edge experience, when Simon won the stage and stage three beating Peter Sagan, yeah. took the and uh, the next day you win the team time trial, take the yellow jersey, he passes it on to Daryl. I mean, even as I'm speaking that sequence, I'm getting goosebumps remembering it. It's uh, and it was a fantastic period for me. That was the highlight of watching the team because I have to be on hand. For you so far, was it Simon Yates winning the Vuelta, Matt uh, Heyman winning uh, Paris-Roubaix, Simon Gerrans yeah. winning Milan San Remo? There's been conquests, but which one stands out to you? Well, they all stand out, but uh, equal first is certainly Nice when the whole team won the time time trial. We went into the yellow. And, and uh, Simon Yates... Uh, when in a welter, I was you know there and uh, but e each one, e each win uh, equals uh, each other. What about the little conquest in Bastia when you got so many headlines? The bus. <laughs> the bus. Um, yes, well, it was my fault. Uh, I arrived and said, "Where's the bus? Oh, we're only four k's. The boys are going to ride back." Uh, to the hotel and uh, I said hey look you know we've got a, a day that we had potentially uh, could uh, win it and what happens after each race the media goes to the bus you know we're not going to be here uh, you should get the bus here so uh, some of the sports directors weren't too happy um, 
um, that I pulled that call, but uh, history is that we crashed the bus. Um, we were told to come under, uh, and it wasn't the bus driver's fault, um, but anyway, we got more publicity out of that than the whole Tour de France, and we got on the front page of uh, the Danish papers, New York Times, it never ever featured anything about cycling, so um, uh, it was a great PR stunt. By coincidence, let's be clear. Well, <laughs> it was. <laughs> So what's the motivation? Well, the motivation is, and this year uh, we're working very hard, and have been for the last six months, and hopefully this year we can announce that uh, we've got a major sponsorship. You know, what we need to do uh, is go that next level. Um, uh, you know, we, our budget is, I think, ranked probably about 10th budget uh, out of the teams, but... Um, uh, we're number one in women's and number one in, in, in uh, number five in, in uh, men. So I think we punch above their weight. Um, so hopefully that uh, we can therefore uh, go to a bigger budget, um, with some more sponsorship, and uh, uh, go that next level. The first year was 2012. We're closing in on rounding out a decade. Do you see it, it's, it, it can't have a, an unlimited lifespan. Usually sponsors come and they're gone within five years in pro cycling. There's a few exceptions. But you're now coming up to one of the stalwarts of the Peloton. Mm, mm. And it wasn't that long ago that you were a novelty new act. Well, we're sitting um, in car 22 in the Peloton um, today. You know, uh, we're sitting up, uh, you know, number three, um, the Giro, the, the Tour de France, we've been up at number one, and uh, I got a taste for that. So uh, hopefully we can maintain that uh, status. To, to carry on from what you were just talking about, it's the motivation comes from trying to elevate Australian cycling status. Well, that, that's certainly been what well, that's always been my motivation. Um, yes. You know, sponsoring uh, from Cathy to the VIS, the AIS, to the AIS um, uh, Olympic campaign events, um, creating competition here, uh, you can't grow and, and continue to grow unless the competition grows around you. So, um, But you know, if it's business or it's sport, I've got a lot of pleasure out of seeing me provide an opportunity uh, for uh, any young person uh, in, in business or, or in sport, as I said, uh, and to see the people that have come through the program, uh, um, we've had some young talent go on to bigger and better things. And you know, Caleb Ewan, right, uh, goes back a long time. Uh, uh, well, I go back further to a young man called Cadell Evans that uh, rode in the Jayco VIS program. And uh, uh, you know, and I sit back and say, well, okay. Uh, I've helped or assisted uh, in that journey. It's very generous, but we can essentially say that the team is benefactor funded, couldn't we? It is, and there's, there's no doubt. Uh, um, as I've said before, my kids uh, uh, are concerned about their inheritance. Each year we, uh, we, they say, well, what's the team costing? Well, I say, okay, how's our asset base this year compared to last year? Uh, yes, it's up, no more questions. So, but on a serious note, uh, yes, it, uh, for us to go next stage, we need to get some corporate money uh, or more corporate money into um, the team. You don't do things by halves. I know that you invested in uh, walking with dinosaurs. Yes, they've just retired after, you know, 8 million people around the world have seen them. Uh, but we currently have uh, Milan Rouge in uh, New York, which is... Uh, I think this is the second selling uh, ticket sales uh, show uh, and we're just about to put four more uh, shows out uh, around the world in the next two years. Um, it's based on the movie, uh, so uh, um, hopefully that uh, uh, we can win a, a Tony. We won a Tony award last year for um, 
King Kong, uh, which was in New York uh, uh, for the creature. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's something I'm very proud of. Once again, uh, it's, it's surrounding yourself with good people that can take you uh, on that journey and, more importantly, uh, success um, and sustainability. And what I was sort of trying to get to with that, I mean, the position that you hold based on that gamble with walking with dinosaurs is that you effectively, for a few years, from my understanding, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, is that you became Australia's richest entertainer. Um, so, in other words, uh, it was a, a roll of the dice and it turned into a, uh, a little bit of gold dust. What you like to get involved in is um, something that you're passionate about. I know horse racing is key amongst them and then you go and win the Melbourne Cup with American. Uh, Won a couple. A couple? Yes, with rekindling. Right, okay, so. well, fill me in because I'm not big on horse racing, so <coughs> but, can you uh, just get that... Uh, <coughs> so we, we, we've had a bit of success in, in that area, but once again... Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hard, you know, if everything was easy, everyone would be doing it. So, uh, but no, it's been a great journey and uh, I'm very fortunate that um, I've had more uh, things go right than wrong. But it is a business and do you see it? That what, cycling? Cycl I mean, your investment is part of your business empire, it, let's say. It, so it, it is. And yeah. cycling falls into that category. Do you see it coming... Let's say you get another uh, title sponsor and a, a big investment from outside. Do you, are, are you in it for the long game so that eventually it starts turning into a profitable entity? Well, the, once again, for most sporting clubs, that uh, um, that what you uh, your income you end up spending. Yeah, there's better businesses around investments in a cycling team, but. Um, what we're looking to do is make it sustainable and, and, and uh, successful. Sustainability is a big passion of yours, or not? It is, um, and the environment, um, but health. You know, you, you look at the people on all different sizes out on bikes. You know, where before they're sitting in a lounge chair. You know, cycling. Uh, Everyone wants to get out there and enjoy uh, the fresh air, and uh, you know it, it, it's a growing not only as a sport but growing as a individuals taking up it uh, as a fitness a form of fitness. And how supportive has the Australian government been in your initiatives? Let's just talk about your association with, let's say, politics. Because uh, if, if that's all right with you... No. That's fine, yeah. Um, I mean, you've yeah. gone through, you've had uh, bipartisan support and uh, I'm curious if it's been uh, your investments into, let's say, the AIS have been reciprocated um, if, by the government, if they're appreciative of the, the input you've offered for cycling and the growth of a sport which offers a, a benefit to Australians. Well, I hope they've appreciated, but um, you know, we've never had any grants or government money <coughs> of any of the businesses that, uh, through uh, uh, cycling or theatre, you know, uh, we have now, through the dinosaurs, we have a company called a Creature Technology Company, which in the last two years has grown from 60 people to 120 to 20, 125 building creatures, animatronic creatures, we're the best in the world. In fact, Universal Studios theme parks would like us to set up all our, all our work as export. We've got work for the next three years. So, you know, but I've never asked the government to support uh, anything that I've done. I don't, I don't rely on government support to uh, achieve what I've done. That leads me to something that I am curious about, and I've heard it as a rumour, so I wonder if I could confirm it, but um, let's say through all the years of Cycling Australia investment, you, I, I don't even want to try and tally the amount of dollars that you've poured into that program, but then it comes to Rio, and I heard it said that you asked if you could attend the track events after having sponsored the teams, the national teams for so many years. Eight years. And... 
probably close to $100 million, probably more. Um, and then My, my accountants can confirm that. <laughs> I'll ask. <laughs> let's, considerable sum, let's say. Yes, yeah. But then you asked if you could go and attend the track events and watch uh, the Australians go head-to-head with the Brits in the much-anticipated team pursuit, which was, of course, a riveting performance. And they said, mm, well, you can buy your ticket. Is that correct? No, w- w- what happened was that uh, I got an email saying that um, you'd been allocated two tickets for four events, but if you want to go to finals, uh, you'll have to purchase tickets. And is that was that the moment where you said, I, I'm done, I've, I don't want to be involved with Cycling Australia any longer? Correct. Um, with the AI's program, was well, was it was Cycling Australia. Uh, it was certainly uh, disappointing after, you know, and I can say it, uh, the lead up to the Olympic Games, you know, it was uh, I invested four million dollars in uh, trying to get our team up to win a gold medal and I got offered four tickets or two tickets for four events and had to uh, buy my own finals tickets. It's kind of shocking, it's kind of upsetting in fact to us listen to it. Well you move on, you, you, you never look back but uh, you know uh, I jumped in the chair for a year to try and Sort out Cycling mm-hmm. Australia, but uh, I think they're on the right path now, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I wish them all the best. Uh, and we'll be there cheering on uh, the Aussies in uh, Tokyo. But watching from afar, I'm probably cheering on Green Edge or Mitchelton Scott athletes rather than. No, no, all Australians. All, all Australians. And, and, you know, it, it's not about just us, all Australians. And. Uh, um, you know, today I, I bumped into lift with uh, Richie. Mm-hmm. I said, Richie, well done, mate. Because, uh, you know, two days ago I said, listen, if we can't win today, I hope you do. Right? And the same with uh, you know, Caleb. Mm-hmm. I always go up, give him a big cuddle and wish him all the best. And, you know, because you, you want you want to see, uh, not only Australians, you, you know, because we're multi-national um, uh, team now and, and uh, you just, you, because it's so hard to win you just want people to uh, you know, achieve it but you know I've been around uh, in business and sport a long time and uh, you know there's always going to be the highs there's the lows and disappointments but you move on mm-hmm. you never look in the rear vision mirror mm-hmm. going forward because you'll end up hitting something right or running, running off the track or off the plan you've got. So you, you, you've got to pick yourself up and, and, and keep going forward. That's, a, that's an impressive attitude um, to have. And it's, it's nice to hear you, to see you so relaxed uh, when I would probably see it as setbacks, stumbling blocks. That's uh, not a question, it's just a statement. Okay, the, the, I treat it as a stumbling box, but not a setback. Okay. Right. You, know, you, you, you look at most important, your health, right, your friendships and relationships, um, and the support you get and you move on. so many highs during this Mitchelton Scott experiment mm. let's call it an experiment but it's prospered is there a moment where you think okay now okay we've done that you know box ticked I'll move on and I'll take up yachting or I'll do something else um, no I, I you know I'm passionate about cycling um, the people um, you know are fantastic uh, um, it's a great sport, um, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of you know people coming up to me and saying, "Hey, well done, Jerry! Thanks for giving us a team." Um, and it's more I've always, and my mother, who was a great role model for me, but she always said, "There's more out of giving than receiving." You know, I grew up in a very humble family of nine children, 
she'd always have a couple of that didn't were extras at the table that you know didn't you know during that hardship and I grew up in the fifties and and uh, and uh, so I'm very fortunate that her values have rubbed off on me. If you took all of your experiences in the cycling game and bundled them together and said to someone, "Here's the, this is the inspiration you need that will change your life," what example would you offer? In terms of you know, as a young rider coming through or. or sports director or as a team, um, it's so important that uh, you develop the right culture, right? And to me, uh, people say, you know, what's the difference, you know, what's the definition for culture? To me, culture is about expectation, right? It's about where you want to be. You set your goals or your standards that you're going to allow uh, to have an untidy office or an untidy factory, or that when people you know, don't meet their targets, you accept that, right? The same with, you know, uh, in sport, in Melbourne Storm, a great example that uh, when Cameron Smith started uh, 12 years ago. This is a rugby league team. Sorry, Just yes. So the Melbourne Storm, yes. That may be tuning in. Uh, he, our win ratio was 63%. Five years ago, it was 72. The last two years, a player coming to the Melbourne Storm, our win r ratio uh, is 83%. So the expectation uh, and the discipline that is built around that. Um, people say to me, what's the difference between business and sport? In business, there's no finish line, right? And one thing that we've done uh, at uh, at Mitchells and Scott is that we keep trying new things. You know, uh, you, you know the world's changing, and Sky has been a, a leader in cycling. You know, that, that you've got to be different. You've got to have a difference between you and the next team. If it's sports science, if it's you know, uh, the equipment, um, so that's uh, you know that's always been my motto: be prepared to change, and make sure you change in and have the right culture. That's a really interesting line because in in business there's no finish line, but the finish line. Um, offers that carrot of, of motivation, if you know what I mean, the carrot before the donkey, that it, mm. it, it, it inspires someone to give their all until they reach the end. Mm. And that when, in an ideal scenario, like we saw with Richie Port at Paracombe Road today, yeah. once he's finished the finish line, he's given it all and he collapses. Mm. And he's exhausted momentarily and then he sparks up and he's got heaps to say and he's got the yeah. energy to continue on and try and win the race. But in business, if there's no finish line, uh, don't you get to a level of fatigue and think I'm done? No, well, um, you know, mentally or physically, um, you, know, uh, you, you always keep looking for the next project or the next sale or um, the next build or, or whatever so um, uh, there's no uh, as I said you might be a, a week a month a quarter the next quarter next year but you've got to keep going uh, I'm trying to think of a word for you there's resilience uh, dogma, dogmatism if that's a word dogmatic. Yeah, resi resili resilience um, and, and resilience in, in life that uh, you know um, is important. You know, resilience from when you're growing up in, in terms of uh, it's uh, too easy to blame someone else, and um, you know when things go wrong in an organisation to own. Well, I look in the mirror and I say, hey, you know, you're the bloke responsible if you hide the wrong CEO or the, you know, and let's say you allowed the 
that culture to develop in an organisation. At the end of the day, I'm the person at, at the top as chairman of a board. Um, so uh, resilience uh, and, and what I project goes down the line um, uh, is important. I'm trying to put myself in your predicament, but if I had a considerable pool of money and the opportunity to take it easy, I would probably take that. Do you think that would ever be your predicament? No. Um, uh, well, you know, I've been successful in business and it's allowed me to do the things that I've done, but I've got a saying that there's no pockets in shrouds. Uh, uh, so you, you, you can't take it with you. Uh, I'm setting up for my children and the next generation, my grandchildren. Um, but uh, yeah, it's different philosophies. And you look at uh, and a great movie I quote is uh, um, Clint Eastwood, uh, that, um, The Mule. And if you watched it, uh, the songwriter said to Clint, uh, you're 88, why are you making another movie? You know, what motivates you? What gets you out of bed every morning? And his reply was, every morning when I wake up, I hear that knock on the door. I never let the old man in. Young forever. Well, and in the song, uh, 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 there's a line that goes, if you don't know the year you were born, how old do you feel? So that's my motto. Um, and uh, hopefully that, you know, that uh, I've made a difference in people's life. Well, I'll be 50 on the day that the Tour de France of 2020 starts. And I look forward to celebrating my 21st birthday with you that day. Terrific. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks for a great chat, Terry. I could go on, but yeah, that's yeah. dominant on the head, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Anyway, thank you. But it's been a great journey, and, and people like yourself that you know, have worked hard to try and you know get cycling out there. It's bloody hard.